In late 2019, I started a new career as a software analyst. Having previously only worked in generalist office jobs, I wasn't sure what to expect. While I had a BA in information technology, knew a good bit about how to use SQL, and faffed around in Unity a fair bit, I was still unsure of what the day-to-day -day of the job would be, and which, if any, of those skills would carry over. Soon after starting, I was given access to our... Integration Platform as a Service. Boomy. As I learned more about the platform, about how to use it to move and translate data between various systems, a thought struck me. Looking at the various logical shapes and pathways connecting them on the process's canvas, it occurred to me I'd seen something like this before. This was Widget Workshop. Now, unless you're one of the five people who played it, that probably requires some explanation. Widget Workshop was a game released in 1995 by Maxis. Yes, SimCity, The Sims, that Maxis. Somehow I managed to save the back half of the box of my copy, complete with the charming magnifying glass and compass it came with. Even a mail-in rebate slip, which feels like an utterly alien concept to software purchases these days. So Widget Workshop is a puzzle game for kids, but not just any kind of puzzle game. A puzzle game essentially about programming logic. You wire and set up different elements on a canvas together to achieve a desired outcome, such as turning on a light bulb or calculating a value. I didn't recognize it at the time being like, seven and all, but this is, in fact, some high-level computer science stuff. Concepts like loops, counters, Boolean logic, functions, inputs and outputs, even the ability to drill down on a given logical shape and set various properties to make the shape function differently. The game doesn't mess around either, some of the puzzles are extremely challenging to this day. While there's only 25 puzzles in the game, there's also a sandbox mode where you can make widgets of your own design. Perfection. The game is, in all meaningful ways, Baby's first low-code development environment. Low-code development is where a significant amount of the finicky bits are abstracted out. For example, being able to get data from a database while only supplying a few select values, and not having to worry about too many of the details and mechanics of actually connecting and getting the data itself. It's somewhat similar to the divide between high-level programming languages and low-level assembly languages, low-code being a step above high-level languages. Anyway, while I only remember playing it for a somewhat short amount of time as a kid, and never fully beating it, I can definitely respect what it was going for in hindsight. Also, the fact that a game released in 1995 works just fine in Windows 10 with only a few sound issues. The publicly available Abandonware version, anyway. Hard to believe it, but in hindsight I was experiencing traces of what would become my current career before even entering middle school. On that note, I'd also like to highlight an obvious subtext here. It was, in hindsight, an absolutely bonkers level of privilege to grow up with a home computer in the 90s. If you think computer hardware prices are bad now, they were far more dire in those days, adjusted for inflation. In my estimation, while home computers are much more prevalent, it's still a massive privilege to have access to one growing up, particularly as it becomes apparent that many and younger generations are missing out on developing critical computer skills. Anyhow, much is said about the general benefits of playing video games, problem solving, hand-eye coordination and all that, but I firmly believe this kind of low-code logic, among all the purported skills, is a uniquely traceable benefit. There are a wide variety of low-code canvas-based platforms out there, and while they all have their own quirks, the learned concepts carry over in a big way. A huge benefit, especially as low-code environments continue to increase in prominence. Of course, Widget Workshop isn't the only game that teaches such concepts. A game series that I'm pretty sure more than five people have played is The Incredible Machine. A venerable set of games, though one with a fittingly convoluted nomenclature. Unlike the more programmatic puzzles of Widget Workshop, The Incredible Machine leans into physical simulation, having you create grand Rube Goldberg devices on a 2D plane. The Incredible Machine games ran from the early 90s all the way into the early 2000s. In each puzzle, you place a variety of objects on the canvas itself having a set of fixed, unmovable objects making up the level. The win condition for each stage can be any number of things, from yeeting an object off canvas to feeding a cat. The challenge comes in the sheer variety of different objects, and the number of different ways in which you can use them. 
For example, exploding a blimp crossing the top of the screen at such a precise time that its burning wreckage falls onto another object at the bottom of the screen, setting it too on fire. Oh, the humanity. Not to mention the variety of explosive parts that can open up whole chunks of each level, radically changing the landscape. If you're into kinetic interactions, you won't be disappointed here. Also of note, wow to some of the music slap. Drawing from a variety of different genres, there are some truly iconic tracks. Though that might just be the nostalgia talking, admittedly. When you can hear the music over the noisy conveyor belts, anyway. Like Widget Workshop, the Incredible Machine offers a robust editor to make elaborate custom contraptions and decorate them with a variety of scenery pieces. Each puzzle on the Incredible Machine is a journey. Often you're fumbling around trying desperately to translate the motion of something, anything, to trigger the other parts of the puzzle figuring out which tools work for your situation and which don't. The way forward is not often particularly clear, and brute forcing won't get you terribly far. You have to thoughtfully snake your way across the canvas, triggering more and more of the already placed tools until you finally hit the one for the win condition. After a while, you start to pick up on subtle visual tells, like objects starting at certain heights or positioned in relation to other objects. You can start to see in the negative space where parts are intended to go. Most of the time, puzzles in the Incredible Machine have a handful of intended solutions, giving you the parts for them with a few red herrings. Yet this part limitation isn't terribly onerous. In relation to low-code development, this is not dissimilar from running into the limitations of various software developed and maintained by the rogues gallery of software vendors out there. These limitations come into play significantly when re-engineering software integrations. For example, say one wants to get or send data to a system over the internet through an application programming interface, or API for short. Oh, the vendor's software doesn't support that. Well, how about we connect to the database underlying the system and go from there? Oh, that's not supported either? Well, I guess we get to party like it's 1999 and transfer data through flat CSV files. In situations like this, sometimes the most valuable information about a system is what it can't do. Working backwards from the limits of a given system helps me tremendously in development. Cut away the impossible and choose from the best set of what options remain. A great many games teach this lesson, but it comes to mind most in the Incredible Machine series. It's the physics simulation equivalent of solving a row or column in Sudoku. Also, real quick here, I want to highlight the fact that the Incredible Tune Machine, the black sheep of the Incredible Machine family, does indeed exist. What a strange one, that is, playing something like a bizarre, itchy and scratchy cartoon. There's more of Bad Rats, the Incredible Machine's weird, violent knockoff, in there than I think most would want to admit. Anyway, moving on. No discussion of games involving programming logic would be complete without mentioning one or more of Zaktronics' works. Zaktronics, in addition to putting out a game that was low-key a major inspiration to Minecraft, are most well-known for their programming games. Of them, admittedly, I have only played Opus Magnum and Space Kim, and while I found Opus Magnum a beautiful, intricate experience, it was Space Chem that introduced me to the Zaktronic style of programming puzzles in the first place. And it is Space Chem that I believe best illustrates the low-code concepts I'll elaborate on. Now, Space Chem's version of programming is setting up instructions for two different manipulator arms, or Waldos. One red, one blue. The Waldos move at a fixed speed on paths you designate, and execute any command shapes that they encounter. 
The goal here is to convert a set of input molecules into a set of output molecules in a given reactor. Often, puzzles even require you to set up multiple different reactors, with even more inputs and outputs, multiplying the complexity. The difficulty escalates pretty quickly. You find yourself needing to create more and more complicated molecules with gradually introduced new devices and commands. Your workspace is limited, and can be especially cramped if you design something poorly in the beginning, preventing you from utilizing an area of the canvas you desperately need to to finish the puzzle. In a sense, this could even be seen as running into your own technical debt. Yet this limitation also pushes you to find great satisfaction in refactoring and optimizing solutions, as you can see where they stack up on the community's metrics. In contrast to the incredible machine, here, there are no intended solutions at all. Past the first two tutorial levels, it's all you. There's no leveling up, no prestige classes, no secret weapons or tools, no negative spaces for the parts. The difficulty curve is overcome only by your knowledge of the game and ability to execute. This can be extremely daunting. However, the game is never truly unreasonable. The difficulty makes the feeling of triumph as you push the button and start seeing the outputs tick up all the more real. There's also a pretty engrossing story, too. A surprising hook to keep you going. It's a nice slice of cosmic horror. The game has you traipsing across the galaxy, producing molecules and defeating terrible space monsters. Personally, I think the framing and aesthetics of the game are great. The music, specifically, is perfection and listening to it outside of the game can feel empowering when tackling difficult problems at work. I believe this is because of the memories evoked from having conquered Space Chem's harder puzzles. If I could solve those complicated simulated situations, who's to say I couldn't solve a real logical one? Now, Space Chem is the ultimate ETL game. By ETL, I mean Extract, Transform, and Load, where data from one system is retrieved, modified as needed, and loaded into another. Mind you, the meat of Space Chem is in the transformations performed in the reactors, less the acts of extracting and loading to the endpoints, which are handled automatically. In Boomi, data transformations are often handled in map shapes, the reactors of Boomi. Side note, given the chemistry-centric naming convention of certain things in Boomi, it's almost a surprise they didn't call them reactors to begin with. But anyway. These maps can contain any number of transformational functions, simple ones that concatenate values together, look up values against sets of cache data, even connect to other systems and look up specific data that way. You can even chain them together in elaborate custom functions. You have to work pretty hard to find situations that can't be mapped out and solved with no or minimal custom scripting outside of the delivered functions. Of all the issues one has to overcome in translating data, date issues crop up surprisingly often. Maybe it's just the industry I work in, but it seems like every piece of software we use has a different date format. Blessfully, Boomi handles most of these translations under the hood, but there's always the exception that breaks it somehow. Fortunately, much in the same way that one learns to deal with recurrent situations in Space Chem, such as dealing with obnoxiously large molecules, one can similarly gain experience enough to quickly deal with these kinds of situations once recognized. Space Chem greatly rewards pattern recognition. While reusing Waldo instructions themselves can be a bit wonky at times, learning what works and applying it to similar situations in the future can both save a tremendous amount of time and allow one to put the logical focus on the new elements of each puzzle. Additionally, I will say it's a great deal of fun to go back to old puzzles armed with new tricks that you've organically taught yourself, to shave off unneeded time or complexity in the rankings. Also of note here is the value of looking up potential optimizations others have done and implementing them in your own solutions. It can still be an interesting challenge to mesh part of somebody else's solution with your own. Yes, admittedly, it is cheating in the context of a puzzle game, but there's only so long one can melt their brain on these things. Copying and implementing code like this is a big part of real life development, after all. In summary, while low-code environments reduce the amount of code one needs to write considerably, there are many situations where one has to build functions and scripts to transform the data in the course of an integration. It is in times like this that I am beyond grateful that I have played Space Chem. It required a level of precision and forethought I had never had asked of me by any game. More than any other game on this list, if you can get to even the midpoint of Space Chem, 
You have terminal computer science brain, a powerful asset that can serve you well so long as you don't let it flatten your view of the world. A half decade before releasing his more well-known work, Roller Coaster Tycoon, game developer Chris Sawyer released Transport Tycoon. Transport Tycoon is a game, as one would expect, about moving cargo and passengers around a sizable world map. As Sawyer famously did with Roller Coaster Tycoon, Transport Tycoon was also written in low-level assembly language, for which he will always have my eternal respect. I also enjoy the irony of using a game programmed in assembly to teach a few low-code concepts. Anyway, it's hard to overstate how much Transport Tycoon was lightning in a bottle. Sawyer himself tried to recapture the magic in 2004 with Locomotion, with very mixed results. Instead, the one to ultimately inherit its mantle would be... itself! Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe, also known as Open TTD. The Open in Open TTD refers to it being an open source, totally free gaming project, using the existing Transport Tycoon as a base to work from. I'm actually even playing it with the sound, music, and graphics copied from the Transport Tycoon Deluxe CD I played on as a kid, though I'm sure most people play it with the completely remade graphics. It's a bit flabbergasting to think that after all these years, Open TTD is still arguably the best game of its kind. Imagine if when Mario 64 dropped, only a handful of 3D platformer games were made after it, none of them measuring up. Admittedly, some Nintendo fans probably don't have to work too hard to imagine that, but it's absurd to me that we don't have any breakout attempts to evolve the genre. We have the Mario 64, but no Galaxy, nor even a Hat in Time. If I'm wrong, please tell me in the comments. Fanboying aside, Transport Tycoon's longevity is no accident. There's a real joy in connecting all the industries and cities of the maps. These strange maps with no existing transportation infrastructure, where everything is just out there, unconnected in the wilderness, prior to your company showing up. Christ, maybe Death Stranding takes place in a Transport Tycoon universe. Anyway, the gameplay loop of gradually expanding your transportation network is a very, very strong one that builds on itself as you create more and more transport routes. Yet at its core is an utter absurdity. You are paid by the distance. Why is this an absurdity? Well, for one thing, why would a power plant agree to pay for coal to be transported from across the map when they could have sourced from the coal mine ten tiles away? I suppose it's much better for the gameplay than the more realistic, alternate pricing model, but I still find it very funny. There are four main types of vehicle in Transport Tycoon. Trucks, ships, planes, and most importantly, trains. Which is funny, because there doesn't even seem to be a train on the game's jewel case. Is this a train? Sound off in the comments if you think this is some kind of train. Anyway, much like in real life, trains are by a wide margin the most interesting, efficient, and cool way to move cargo. It is in the rails that Transport Tycoon teaches its most salient lessons. The sprawling rail networks that crisscross the landscape of a given map often represent hours of work, where one must consider questions of capacity, scale, and flow. What do I mean by this? Well, for example, take your first rail route. A simple affair from a raw material source to its destination industry. You set up the route in a loop, with one track heading to the destination industry, and one back. With this kind of setup, you can send a fairly large count of trains from the source to the destination. A rule of thumb I use is to always have a train loading resources in the source station. Even at this very early stage with only a single point-to-point -point rail network, significant interruptions of the network are possible. Say, for example, a train breaks down, stopping all the other trains behind it for a time. One can choose to play with breakdowns turned off, admittedly, but I find the challenge much more interesting with them on. This breakdown interrupts the flow of the network, losing potential money as you are paid more the faster you deliver to goods. Not just from the broken down train either, but the trains behind it. There are a few different ways to work around this. To start, trains need servicing every once in a while to avoid constant breakdowns. One needs to have train depots. These impossibly small single-tile buildings that can somehow fit an entire train inside. Trains will divert to these depots after breakdowns and at set intervals. 
Now, this too presents something of a flow problem for a rail network, as train depots slapped haphazardly directly on the network will slow it down every bit as much as breakdowns will, as trains will slow down considerably when entering and exiting depots as the other trains wait for them. But this can be ameliorated by giving the depots some extra track to let trains get up to speed and merge back onto the network. Yet all the servicing in the world won't stop random breakdowns completely. To fully handle the situation, one has to increase the capacity of the network. By this, I mean have more rails going in either direction to allow trains to navigate around the stalled train and keep the journey going. Trains in OpenTTD can pathfind pretty well with the enhanced signals, arguably OpenTTD's greatest original feature. Now, while doubling up on tracks is not necessary in the very beginning of the game, you'll find yourself wanting a good set of at least two tracks going in either direction on your main lines as you build them out. As one starts to build the network, building up routes with new sources and destinations, there's a bevy of issues that invariably crop up. The aforementioned question of capacity does not simply go away with a mere redundant set of rails. The tendency is to want to keep pouring more and more trains onto the existing network to avoid having to build new lines and to leverage the existing network as much as possible. But too many trains can choke a network and reduce the overall speed of all the trains in it as they reach a near gridlock state, quietly taking turns moving six tiles each. An inattentive player may see a station overflowing with waiting cargo from this slowdown and build yet more trains, exacerbating the problem. The train is late. Adding to the complexity here is that industries change production levels all the time, both increases and decreases, so it can be very easy to mistake a slowdown in the overall network for an increase of raw material production, leading to, well... I'm sending in more trains! <laughs> Load balancing here can be a very tricky proposition. The simple act of mass upgrading train engines can change the character of a rail network dramatically. Initially from the added breakdowns, which can happen when upgrading to new engines super early, and later from the added speed increasing the throughput of a given route. All that said, there's a lot of room for tinkering, optimizing the rail networks. Or one could just build ludicrously high capacity stations and cover the map with spaghetti rails. That can be a riot too. I hope you made lots of spaghetti. Aside from these questions of slowdowns and capacity, there is also a situation that can genuinely kill your rail network outright. That of the deadlock. Take for example this oil refinery. It accepts oil from the oil train supplying it, and produces a tremendous amount of goods to be taken to a city on the other side of the map by goods trains. Now here's the kicker. The amount of goods produced is directly tied to the amount of oil taken in. No oil, no goods. Say, for example, you're only using one station for this oil refinery. It would not take much for it to be jammed with goods trains, preventing the oil trains from delivering anything. Now, the long-term behavior of this is every train destined for that refinery station stacking up in front of the entrance. It's a pretty good bet that that will block other elements of your network, too, to say nothing about the tremendous waste of the stuck trains themselves. Now one could try to solve this quickly by splitting the station into two parts and using waypoints to route the oil trains one way and the goods trains another way, with a suitably long track split before the station, but this only solves part of the problem. Every single goods train on the same network as the oil train slows the system down, hurting its overall train speed and throughput. For that reason, it's the optimal solution in this situation to just bite the bullet and make a whole separate network for these second tier products and never the twain of their trains shall meet. Although, maybe a few incidental trains here and there, hundreds of tiles away from the heaviest traffic, couldn't hurt. Such are the temptations that creep in. So what's the core difference between OpenTTD and the games previously mentioned? In a word, change. A solution in Widget Workshop, The Incredible Machine, and Space Chem will always work if it's worked once already. By contrast, in OpenTTD, one has to build for the future to be successful, and continually monitor what's actually going on in the network. One must always be ready to step in and fix things, as new forms of traffic or significantly increased volume are added. To say nothing about your network's oil refinery being obliterated by aliens, if you're playing with disasters on. These kinds of required changes are the norm in the real world. 
No software integration lasts forever. Eventually, one or both of the systems involved with a given integration will require a change, or even be replaced with an entirely new system. It's generally even a good thing that such changes are required as they can imply new functionality being delivered to the users. That said, the oil refinery being obliterated by aliens situation can indeed crop up here too. Say, for example, an integration that had been quietly pulling down data from a vendor's Amazon S3 bucket every day for years suddenly stops working completely. You scramble for a time, check to make sure S3 isn't down again, and quickly reach out to them. They tell you that you need a new software tool that needs to be deployed and run on a server somewhere. Okay, cool. Must have missed that email. Let's such as integration. Despite all the curveballs, with a little care, integrations can be durable. Making peace with change is the first step to handling it, and taking the time to sand off the hard edges now can save you a ton of pain down the line. In OpenTTD, there's also a lesson in considering the big picture and trying your hardest to anticipate knock-on effects. Complicated pieces of software can have a lot of unexpected interactions, in exactly the same way as adding a new rail route to a large and complex OpenTTD rail network. Anyway, to those who have never played Transport Tycoon or OpenTTD, I strongly recommend the latter. It's free on Steam, so it's literally never been easier to get a hold of the most recent version. Do, uh, be careful though, as the game essentially creates its own temporal pocket dimension, hurling you violently into the future if you're not careful. Definitely keep a clock handy. On that note, let me introduce the final of the five games I intend to cover though I will have a quick section for some honorable mentions after. And finally, we arrive at Factorio. Factorio is a game where you crash land alone on an alien planet, with the end goal being to launch a rocket back to space. Now, unlike, say, Pikmin, you can't just find your wayward starship parts scattered in the crash. You need to make everything from scratch. You need to harvest the resources to make the things, to make the things, to make the things, in effect. Not only that, you need to make, make, make the things to research how to make new things. And you need a lot of it. All of it. Hence, your focus becomes building a sprawling factory complex which produces everything you need for your rocket in an automated and hopefully scalable way. Going back to the Pikmin comparison, you're not exactly doing this with the approval of any part of the natural world. As your factory expands its ecological footprint, more and more aliens attack it, seeking to remove your pollution from their planet. Many of the games on this list that physically simulate programming logic feature bugs that can crawl in from environmental factors, but here they are particularly vicious. Symbolically, it's quite a striking allegory for resisting extractive capitalism, but that aside, Factorio brings together quite a few of the concepts I've spoken of already, and it does so in a way core to the success of its gameplay. Gameplay so successful that it's a running joke in the community to call it Cractorio because of its addictive properties. Take for example here, in this freshly generated world, you can see the outlines of where you can build your initial factory in the negative spaces between the starting resources. After getting your first powered miners and initial conveyor belts set up, you encounter the space chem like challenge of feeding your first stone furnaces. It can be tricky to get the right configuration of robotic arms when working at this early stage. And of course, the importance of building for the future can't be overstated here as building something in a cramped and weird manner can be a recipe for headaches down the line. Though I will say, unlike space chem, you're given a lot more in the way of new tools to change things up later on. Faster conveyor belts, trains, and even flying drones. All these wonderful tools that make moving parts and materials around the factory all the more interesting. Keeping the factory fed is quite the challenge too. Unlike Transport Tycoon, where raw material production can vary without warning, here you're presented with the literal amount of all the raw materials on their deposits, ticking down to depletion. You must therefore monitor your raw materials carefully, and expand your harvesting to new deposits. These deposits can be pretty far from your main complex, requiring you to make use of trains. Adding trains to the mix requires you to solve some of the problems that crop up in Transport Tycoon, such as signaling and whatnot. Yet here, there's even more challenges you have to worry about everything down to fueling the trains, and bugs eating the tracks, of course. 
There's also the precarious balance between inputs and outputs that can put your load balancing ability to the test. You often have to carefully, or not so carefully, divide out the intermediate materials like iron plates between tons of different production chains. A delicate balance, but a fun one to tinker with. Even from the raw materials side, something as simple as trying to expand your iron smelting capacity can run the risk of depleting your coal production, which can leave your factory powerless until you increase production or find other power sources. Power, too, being yet another resource to manage and bring more and more capacity online as needed. To bottom line it, Factorio is the perfect game to play if you're looking to build up skills relevant to creating and maintaining low-code solutions. It's in the types of problems you solve, the types of, uh, bugs you encounter, the way you discover tricks and efficiencies along the way. All of this adds up to a great, if dangerously addictive, teaching tool. While obviously nothing is a substitute for doing the work itself, one can build up these systemic patterns of thought, like asking the right questions, keeping the whole system in mind when making changes, and planning for the future. It's also a damn good game to boot. Don't wait for it to go on deal. The developer chose the path of never putting it on deal ever, which is an interesting approach, but one that definitely seems to have worked out for them. Anyway, now for the honorable mentions. First, I want to mention Minecraft. I'll qualify this by saying I've never really gotten into Minecraft, for whatever reason it just never clicked with me, but I'd be a fool not to mention some of the things people are doing with it from a computer science perspective. Stuff like making working graphing calculators utilizing code written on the landscape of the game itself. It's pretty fascinating that these things are possible, though I wouldn't exactly call it low code. Seems more like an exercise in electrical engineering, and quite a spectacular one at that. In these works, I'm reminded of the Antikythera mechanism, the ancient Greek computer physically calculating the positions of the planets and eclipses with gears. It's hard to imagine the kind of person who made this stunning marvel and calculation, not seen again for centuries, but I would put to you, it's the same kind of person making these absurdly intricate works in Minecraft and other games. Also, there's this guy that connected Minecraft to Salesforce directly. On one hand, cool, on the other hand, why? I also want to mention Baba is You. It takes the idea of physical code in a very interesting direction, though I wouldn't say it's all that analogous to solving systemic or programming issues. I will say it causes one to think very carefully about the required order of operations in solving a situation, which is often something to keep in mind. Finally, I'll mention the Anno games. While they all have some of the same production chain gameplay as Factorio, so much of the meat of transporting goods and materials is abstracted to an absolutely absurd degree. Of course, that's likely because, at heart, they're far more city builders than factory floor simulators, much more focus on supplying people with goods. Still very fun games, of course, and can provide some of the challenges mentioned earlier, particularly in keeping supply chains up and running, but I wouldn't say it rises to the same level as Factorio or Transport Tycoon. A catchphrase among some of the most obnoxious people on the planet is learn to code. A petulant, classist refrain because it tacitly implies that people who work non-coding jobs don't deserve better wages. And self-aggrandizing in that it tells the other person to be more like the person saying it, who generally does know how to code. I'm not here to tell you to learn to code, or even low code. That said, if low-code development seems interesting, you might consider checking it out. If you've played and enjoyed some of the games mentioned, you should definitely consider checking it out. Bookmark W3 School sequel page, pick a low-code environment, and go. Some environments, like Salesforce, have a wealth of free tutorials online. If you wind up liking it enough, maybe take a class at your local community college. Don't be afraid. It's not like calculus or whatever. Computer science requires little in the way of obscure math, and even better, there's very few problems that are legitimately novel. There's a huge wealth of shared knowledge out there, and the right answer to a given problem can be as simple as a Google away. Pretty high chance that you, watching this, can do it if you give it a shot. So all that said, that's where I'm gonna leave it. Thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed this, please really do like and subscribe and all that. I realize low-code stuff is a somewhat obscure subject, so if you'd like to see more on it, please let me know in the comments. Thanks again, and I hope to see you in the next one.